All right, so today we have my good friend uh, and colleague, very good friend for 20 years now, Professor Sean Anderson. We met while we were both, uh, I was a PhD student at Stanford, and he was doing his postdoc. He's, uh, he, want, he did his undergrad degree in ecology and evolution at UC Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. where he was a big party animal. <laughs> a little bit. Had a big DJ business. That was good. What business? I had, a big, I had the number one DJ business in Santa Barbara. Well, that's a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I knew, I, I knew that. Um, I knew you were pretty busy there. Um, so he is PhD in population biology and uh, marine biology yep. in UCLA. Mm -hmm. And he's a uh, professor at uh, uh, California State University Channel Islands uh, near Ventura. Great location. And um, Sean uh, is an amazing teacher, very uh, engaging, and he uh, won the Maximus Teaching Award. So do they salute you like Maximus? Yes. Unless yes. you enter. Yes, they, they chop off their ears and all that kind of exactly. Roman stuff, yeah. Yeah, um, and, um, and he, did, he's, he does amazing applied work. Um, he teaches uh, restoration ecology, conservation biology, uh, drones, uh, which is very cool, I just learned that. And, um, and the fact that you sign uh, your syllabus in agreement is thanks to him. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> sorry. I that sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. Yeah, he, he suggested that, so that's a genius idea. Um, and, uh, and he's uh, very energetic. We uh, did a lot of work in eastern Turkey uh, at Lake Kujuk, which I uh, told you about. In fact, from the beginning of that project, Sean... Um, did a lot of uh, experiments, including cattle enclosure experiments and fences. He measured Lake Kujuk every year with detail, and actually we need those data now for a paper. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, and he was instrumental in our application to get it um, declared Eastern Turkey's first Ramsar wetland. And uh, we had some uh, fun times together in Turkey. And he also- <laughs> All kinds of good stories. You exactly. probably shouldn't tell the students about. <laughs> Well, uh, one of them was uh, one of my team member uh, dropped his Panasonic Tough Book into the lake. And then while I was trying to dry it next to the space heater, he melted it. And, uh, and that's basically- The yeah, Turkish heaters are very strong. Yeah, so th They're that's why I, I never use a Tough Book because it's pointless. <laughs> I just uh, use a regular la laptop. And the other one, uh, wait, uh, wait, I just, you just made me forget. The Which one, Tulsa? What's that? Tulsa? Uh, no, no, no. Yes, I remember. Uh, he introduced a uh, brand new technology to Turkey, oh. <laughs> the medieval post pounder. Yes. So, high tech, high tech yeah. post pounding. So when we're putting yes. up the cattle exclosure fences, uh, you know, we had people like using sledgehammers sideways to put them into ground. And like said, with, the, with the thing about their head height with the sledgehammer, it was like super sketch. Super yeah. Oh, sketch. and while, while balancing on a ball of barbed wire. And, a, and a one guy holding Super the guy sketch. in the waist. Um, Super sketch. And once they were doing that, the sledgehammer had just broke off and went flying. And he said, dude, like, why don't you, why don't we get a post pounder? And I said, I don't think that technology exists in Turkey. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm sure it does. You just don't know about it. So we just went around cars to, uh, you know, uh, uh, stores asking for it. They never heard of it. So uh, had like to build it. And yeah, and then we went to a welder to have it built from steel. And he's got uh, uh, yeah. his uh, faculty web uh, page photo is that welder while he's welding this <laughs> with a cigarette in his mouth and no eye protection. And flip flops, <laughs> flip flops on, flip flops And flip flops. Massive sea of sparks. Yeah, like sparks going everywhere. It's like, you know? So, uh, and then well, we, we had our post ponder, <laughs> and the local farmers were amazed. They're like, this is revolutionary. <laughs> we are in the Renaissance now. Yeah, you're welcome. So, you're welcome. Anyway, so we still use the post ponder. Yeah, so anyway, so I have many stories, but I'll let you tell his stories. Um, and I look forward to seeing this. Uh, most, pretty much all of it is going to be new. So. Yeah. Oh, and he's been, uh, he's, uh, he does, he has another great course. He's been working in New Orleans since Katrina, and he takes students to, uh, to New Orleans for restoration. So a lot of amazing applied work. So let's see. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, thanks everybody. So uh, I will talk for hours, and so I'll try to stay within uh, the time here. You guys feel free to interrupt me. I'm recording this, so I'll share it with you guys after. So if you just want to focus on, on asking questions and stuff and, and look at the slides later, you're, you're welcome to. But, um, but yeah, so Tron asked me to talk about uh, uh, marine conservation. I was like, what do you want to talk about? Like, marine conservation. So I have a couple different things here. We probably won't get to it all. Um, and uh, so I'll just start rambling for a while. And if stuff is interesting, tell me and we can focus more on that. Um, uh, so it sounds like you guys haven't touched very much on the marine aspect, given, given where we are, which is totally understandable. And so um, I put this together a little bit of sort of general intro, and then we'll sort of start diving into some, some uh, examples of, of current uh, conservation challenges. And so the first thing is, I think in general, what I've seen in, sort of with most of our community, but especially after the pandemic, there's a lot of people that seem very depressed and seem to be like the world is ending and doomerism and all that BS, right? So, so um, I get where it comes from, I understand, but it's a matter of our frame of reference, how we choose to, to look at these, these challenges we're talking about, climate change, habitat fragmentation, all these things. And so, so we can choose to take this, this uh, a Sumerian view, this Greek, Greek idea of um, uh, these people live in perpetual darkness and everything is sketch and it's always dangerous and it's bad. Uh, you know, you could choose that or you could choose to be uh, the same exact view but take a different perspective on it. And something like the Saris that, that were the same thing, Greek mythology, but it was all, they would look at things and they would perceive optimism. They would perceive, hey, we could, we could make this better, we could do something. And it really is a matter of our choice. And we're very fortunate that we live in a time and place when we can have that opportunity of choice for how we see these things. And so, um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is some very brief, super simple overview of the ocean, just because it sounds like you guys maybe haven't talked much about the ocean. Um, and then talk a little bit about stressors and capabilities. Um, and the key themes here throughout all this stuff, which is also throughout all of conservation biology, modern stuff, is, is this issue of scale. Um, the expanding, often expanding scale of impacts that we're, de we're detecting. Um, secondly, uh, the changing temporal, so that would be spatial scale. Then the changing temporal scale of things. So things, stressors, et cetera, seem to be coming quicker and quicker uh, at, at different rates than they historically have, have come, whether that's a natural disaster or, or something else. And then the third one is the recognition of synergisms, the, the recognition that uh, these things are starting to interact in ways that we can't necessarily easily predict, that aren't additive or subtractive or something. So those themes kind of run throughout. Um, and then I, when, I was, when I was first talking to Sean, I was like, oh, I'll put some things together. So I was mostly going to talk about microplastics and deep sea mining uh, today. Um, if we have time, I'll talk about out-of-kind mitigation and these, uh, these other things all phase into it, but I, I will only be able to talk about probably most of these three things. So again, if you guys want to hear more about something, Tell me to, to, like, this is boring, let's go, I want to hear about that. Um, so first I'll play you guys a little example of an ad for one of a, a, a research class I'm teaching this summer that just sort of, I think, highlights a little bit of this um, in, incredible new power that we have in terms of assessment and also opportunities for management. So let's see, I hope this isn't, isn't too loud and blows you guys out, let's see. Hey everybody, we have a new research uh, class this uh, summer, if you're interested in participating. It's gonna be focused on um, understanding different aspects of the deep sea and our, and our nearshore marine environment. So we'll be looking at things like um, the shark teeth that are forming manganese nodules, deep sea manganese nodules like this guy, which we're getting ready to start mining for um, our transition away from fossil fuels. So we have more lithium and rare earth elements and things like that so we can uh, work on the transition away from our fossil fuel economy. We'll be looking at, at microplastic loading and different uh, sea critters and things of that nature. So, so we'll be starting off looking at some of our macroplastics, but then using our cool new um, fancy uh, FTIR uh, here to actually understand um, what's going on with, uh, with um, the plastics that are in critters and in sediments and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, so you guys will be able to learn how to run this stuff, do the chemical characterizations, do the fingerprinting, um, and get some experience working with uh, uh, samples from crazy parts of the ocean. So if you're interested in that. Okay, anyway, that was just a little ad for a thing on my campus. But, um, 
but you get the idea. So first, before we talk about um, those things, let's talk a little bit about some of the stressors and what I mean by stressors and, and the challenge that we're facing. Um, so we can start with fire, something we all have experience with and seems like maybe a traditional stressor. Um, but it's happening in different ways. So this is Malibu. So this is where Barbie was filmed and all that kind of crap, right? Um, and so this is highly unusual. This, this particular example is 2018, the Woolsey Fire. Um, this started near a town called Simi Valley, um, which is um, uh, uh, inland from the coast. It started right next to the freeway. It's a big freeway that goes basically almost straight to the ocean, then makes a dog leg, and then takes a, a sort of windy road across these mountains, the Santa Monica Mountains, to the ocean. So if we got in a car right there in Simi Valley, and, and you know, it's a, it's a freeway, right, regular freeway, jumped in the car, went to the coast, we would get there in about 45 minutes or so. The fire got there in about an hour and 10 minutes. So that's how fast, in this case, this is a wind-driven, what we call Santa Ana wind-driven fire. This is how, how quickly this stuff evolved. Um, so mansions on the coast where like Tony Stark lived and stuff was all on fire. Crazy, super, super crazy. This is not the norm. This is the very first time we hear about contraflow in the context of Florida, Texas. We have a hurricane coming in. We reverse um, some of the directions of freeways so everybody can leave Houston, leave New Orleans, leave wherever, go north usually. This is the first time ever we had contraflow in California. In, in this case, all of, the, all of the lanes of traffic were directed to come towards Los Angeles so people could evacuate. So this is not normal. This is very weird. Uh, we're finding all kinds of things we didn't previously predict. One of them is the amazing change in air quality and degradation in, in air quality. And when we think about that typically, we think about that in terms of people. So you guys might have seen the stuff during the, during the pandemic of um, insane levels of smoke around San Francisco. This looks like Blade Runner, right? This, is, this isn't a funky filter. This is what it actually looked like. Everything was orange. In fact, in my dad's house north of, north of the city of San Francisco, he thought, he, he woke up and he thought he was, it was midnight, not noon, right? I mean, it was crazy dark. It was insane. Um, and this is, now we can detect this signal from this fire that normally wouldn't hit the coastal zone and now is, is all over the coastal zone. Now we're seeing this track out into the ocean. And, and, and these, these are aerosols that are um, problematic. And we see that show up in different places. So you guys are in green here in the Rocky Mountain. This is increased uh, uh, health problems associated with, with smoke over the years. So you guys this light green, so it doesn't look like it, but you guys have increased a bit in terms of your, your uh, asthma-related uh, admissions to hospitals, emergency department visits, et cetera. Um, but it actually has increased for you too. It's increased for just about everybody. But we in the West, in California, et cetera, it's gone up dramatically. So we're seeing dramatic human health impacts from that, that historic stressor we thought we understood. That's doing things like causing massive consternation in, in California's wine industry, which is a $55 billion a year industry. Um, lots of wine is starting to get destroyed, not because of flames, but because of the smoke taint that makes the wine taste bad. And so people don't want to buy wine. <clears throat> We're also seeing this shift plankton populations offshore. So this ash input is essentially like a fertilizer. So we're seeing shifting community compositions, you can see down here, from some of um, uh, some, some species profiling that has been going on since, in this case, this 2018 fire and the Thomas fire in 2017. So all kinds of stressors going on. Um, we've all, we're also seeing different changing populations. So this is some of our work um, in Hawaii. So we use drones to, in the Maui Channel to fly over, like in the upper right picture right here, this is um, a, a mom and a calf. Go up and then down again. Yeah, they learn eventually. Uh, and so, so we've been following these whales for uh, several decades. Um, and so this is a mom about to breach right in front of the boat and then her baby will come. This was, uh, this was uh, seven weeks ago. Um, and so we use, so this is the traditional way, sorry, it's so loud. So this is the traditional way we've studied whales. Um, we uh, now have, have crowdsourced this. So uh, whales' flukes, their tails, are, are unique, just like our fingerprints. So if you take a photograph, we can actually now put that in this thing called Happy Whale. You can do the same thing if you're visiting up folks up in Alaska, wherever, and upload it. And then we use uh, machine learning to classify these things so we act can actually document 
whale populations and, and uh, demographics over time. We use our drones, like the upper right picture, to look straight down and get the body condition of mom. So when she's really fat, that means she's got a lot of you know, reserve, she's super healthy. As she gets skinnier and skinnier and skinnier, we can predict when she's gonna, um, she and her calf will start to migrate back to Alaska. These whales in the Maui Channel spend uh, sort of winter time in Hawaii, the rest of the year feeding up in Alaska. So they go between those two areas. So, our, so citizen science, a super key tool, technology. Way back when, when Sean and I were, were at Stanford, people used to always poo-poo this. Some people still poo-poo this. They say, citizen science can't do real stuff. Those people have their head up their ass. It's a fantastic tool. You have to train people the right way, but it's an incredibly much more powerful way to collect global scale, larger scale data. So we do that with citizen science, and then we do it with our learning through what we call service learning classes, where we go to Hawaii, go to New Orleans, and do that kind of stuff. So they're really fantastic new tools. One example of the value of that is this data, which is a paper just came out. And uh, the blue line is what I want to talk about, which is um, the population of whales that we have in Hawaii. These are humpback whales. Um, and what we see is starting around uh, the mid-teens, uh, they started to drop. This is all from our citizen science and our service learning class data. Um, and what seems to have gone on here is the big blob. You might have heard about the heat wave, the big blob. That, we're not entirely sure, but the most parsimonious explanation right now seems to be that food resources tanked in Alaska. And so therefore, when the moms were coming down here to give birth, they either didn't make it or they had failed calf births. And so we're st for the first time since we stopped commercial whaling, these humpback populations are now declining again. Again, an insight that we would not have if it wasn't for citizen science and for uh, 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 service learning classes and things like that. This is data from my son. This is Gabriel's data. This, my son was, was abroad in Australia. He's a junior. Um, and, and this is some of his monitoring data looking at uh, coral recovery on the Great Barrier Reef. And this is after several big perturbations, cyclones, bleaching events, et cetera. And so he um, found that actually after about six years, the coral reefs seem to be recovering. Um, and so, so that's great, but we don't fully understand the scale of these populations recovering. So these are all factors that we're trying to grapple with now um, as we move forward. Um, and we see pelagic changes and population structure changes, et cetera. Okay, any questions about that so far? Making sense? Am I going too fast? Am I, talk, am I trying to stay on, on, on time too fast? Okay, so a quick uh, overview of the ocean. This is what you guys, thanks for filling out my survey, this is what you guys think of as the ocean. Right, so clearly water is important, blue is important. So we have some critters in there. We have fish, we have whales, right? We have life, that's great. But most of the ideas we have there are, are uh, abiotic or, 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 or gross uh, physical condition, which, which, is, which, is, which is cool, which, which is how, which is, that's typically what we get. Okay, so I study uh, the, the ocean and the coast, and by the coast, what I mean by the coast is the chunk of the sea that's, that directly influences the land and the land that directly influences the sea. There's all kinds of legal definitions. In my coastal management class, we spend many lectures talking about this. But suffice it to say, it means, it means the stuff right next to the land, the stuff right next to the sea. Um, the coastal zone is incredibly important. It's where the vast majority, it's where a disproportionate part of we humans live. It's where a disproportionate amount of our economy um, is activated and it's where um, we have some of the greatest risks as we're going forward, particularly in places like Southeast Asia, and places like Bangladesh, right? When we have sea level rise in California, it sucks and it causes problems. When they have sea level rise, they just die, right? So, so we really have to come to terms with this and having a new frame of reference that has an environmental justice lens, not just the typical ecological structure, function, et cetera, is absolutely fundamentally essential to, to, to properly grappling with these having everybody feeling included in the conversation and being able to pr provide um, effective solutions for that stuff. And so there's an, as many people alive right now just in the immediate coastal fringes of the world as were alive in the entirety of the earth in the 1950s. So it's a lot of people concentrated in a very small, narrow area. Uh, suffice it to say, I uh, probably won't talk about this much more, but I, I'll just mention that there's a very different coastal versus inland dynamic in all kinds of stuff, in terms of environmental policy, in terms of people's attitudes. This is, this is uh, uh, people's response to the pandemic, but it doesn't matter. So, so this coastal inland is a, an important difference. That's the coast. As far as the ocean, since this might be the only slide you guys get on the ocean this, this semester, um, it's huge. It's ma yeah. The previous slide, the difference do you mean like a cultural difference or actual spatial, like density of humans versus? Bo bo both. 
every, everywhere we slice it. So demographically, um, uh, higher income, higher educational attainment, uh, coastal versus inland. Um, if you want to talk about people's political pers uh, uh, predilections or, or behaviors, how much seafood they eat, how, all that kind of stuff, the coastals. So, so I grew up in San Francisco. Um, and uh, there's this thing where Northern California people talk smack about Southern California people, right? And, and so when I was a kid in the 70s, we had, you know, droughts. We had to cut back water. And so it was like, you know, this county in Northern California reduced water by like 25%, and these guys reduced water by 18%, like LA, 2%. And we're like, what? You know? And it, the LA guys were always like, what? It's chill, bro. What's the problem, man? And it's always like, God, this is, this is. So I always, well, I was raised, the, the lore, the cultural lore is there's this like northern part of the state versus the southern part of the state. That's all BS. The real difference is inland versus coastal. And we see that in Turkey. We see that in Louisiana. We see that in Belize. We see it all over the place. So it's a general phenomenon that we humans have different behaviors and, 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 and perceptions when we're at the coast versus when we're we're inland. And it's not that one's better than the other, but it's important to understand that when we propose policies and stuff. Yeah? So was it more so people that live on the coast were more aware of the water usage, or was it the opposite? Uh, it was people, in, in that case, it was people in Northern California were, at least that was the lore. But when you actually break it down, yes, people on the coast were much more, much more um, effective at reducing water than inland. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, okay, so our one, are your one ocean slide for the semester? Um, so the ocean is massive, right? It's massive. Um, uh, it is mostly deep as hell, right? It's the largest biosphere, largest part of our biosphere on the planet, right? So it's almost four kilometers deep on average. The deepest deep, deep part, which is the Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench, is crazy deep, right? The tallest mountain on Earth is not K2, it's not Everest, it's this Hawaiian volcano we don't perceive that because we only see the terrestrial part, the part that's in the air. If we actually go down to the bottom of the ocean, that is the, the essentially the island of Hawaii is the largest mountain uh, on the surface of the earth. Um, okay, so it's very deep, it's dark, it's almost all dark, um, and it's very cold on average. So on average, it's about three degrees Celsius um, uh, as far as temperature, and it's been here for billions of years, right? So there's been a lot of time for things to evolve, a lot of times for things to change and adapt. So it's a huge part of our, of our world, we, but we often, it's often out of sight, out of mind, so we typically don't have an engaged with it historically for you know, understandable reasons. Okay, let's talk about, any questions, that makes sense? All right, cool. Okay, so I'm gonna start talking about microplastics, if, that, if you guys are interested, and then go to, to deep sea mining. Okay, so let's talk about microplastics. Um, so uh, have you guys talked about toxicology at all yet in here? Okay, so toxicology. Toxicology is the study of killing people. Toxicology is the study of poisons. It was born, the modern, I, uh, or the, the, the foundations, a lot of different societies did poisonings, but where it was most sophisticated was in medieval Europe. Why? Because there's all these a-holes trying to run the country by just marrying their sisters and brothers and stuff, right? So if you wanted to be in power, if you wanted to be in power, you, like, oh God, I, I've got to get rid of these guys. So poisonings became very sophisticated and very subtle. And so this picture shows this taster drinking some, so the king is up there, he's like, I'm not drinking this, you drink this, right? And then if that dude didn't die, he's like, okay, I guess I could drink this. And that, but that was very secret. That was very non-peer reviewed. That was very in the shadows. It, it comes into the, what we would call a modern science and the very late 1800s, very early 1900s, especially in New York City. So New York City, huge, you know, massive exploding populations of immigrants, all kinds of crime and things going on with these, these, these shifted social dynamics. And so the police were called in to deal with all kinds of stuff. So what would become like CSI gets going, and this guy here um, is one of the fathers of that, and he starts to essentially apply some of the lessons from medieval poisoning to modern deaths. Oh, so when, when people die from carbon monoxide, their, their fingertips are blue. And, and so from that, we get the modern field of toxicology. This is the historic view of just about all of toxicology, especially up to about 1990. This is the so-called dose response curve. So the idea here is on the x-axis, there's some measure of the toxin or the thing we're worried about. And then on the y-axis, it's some measure of effect. That could be death. 
that could be the proportion of people in the population that die, that could be a behavioral response, it doesn't matter, you pick. And the idea is, at low exposures, here off to the left, at low exposures, um, there's, there's either no effect or very, very, very little effect of this, of this substance, let's say, being exposed. And then we do some experiments and we do more and more and more stuff. And eventually, um, at some level, it causes a big change. And most of the historic research in toxicology was directed at figuring out the shape of this curve. Was it, was it, you know, was it, you know, just, uh, you know, typical sigmoidal? Does it jump up very fast early on? Does it take a long time to get up? And that was where the, the research was all about. Toxicology is the study of poisonings in humans. Ecotoxicology is the study of poisonings for everything, humans and critters and the environment and everything. And so this was our, this was our um, historic model. This now has gotten much more complicated because of some, some things. Um, so put a pin in that. Um, plastics, let's talk a little bit about plastics. So uh, plastics were this amazing technology, um, super, super cool. I'm running a, a workshop on, um, on policy in, uh, this weekend. And so I've been diving deep into some of the historic literature for this. But, but suffice it to say, this is an ad from the 1950s. Look at that. Hallelujah. Voyage of Discovery. Oh, my God, a beautiful beach. And what's on it? A plastic radio. <gasps> oh, crap, a plastic cup. Oh, my God, it's so beautiful, right? This is how it was portrayed. New, especially after World War II, leisure. This is, this is the key to having a, a, a nice life, a, a simple-to-maintain life, et cetera. The first real commercial scale plastic is produced in this thing is in a museum in England. This thing, which w the stuff was called Bakelite, and it was essentially little covers for electric circuits. Um, and, and then from there, uh, things went super crazy. So now we go to the store and virtually every single thing we touch is plastic. This, this, this podium is plastic. This microphone is plastic. Um, there is plastic in this display screen. Um, my phone is, is covered, the rubber around here is plastic. Um, my my undergar this this T-shirt is plastic, right? I mean, everything is plastic. Now, uh, sometimes when we talk about environmental challenges, there's an there's an a hole at the center of it, right? But oftentimes it's not that, and it's very easy to think that. Oftentimes, people went down a path that we thought would help us with something, and it's it's not people trying to be jerks or trying to be mean or trying to be callous. It's we didn't understand our power. We didn't understand the consequences of particular choices. And that's absolutely the case with plastics, right? At least initially. And so this idea of unintended consequences is dominant across conservation biology. It's, 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 it's you know, everywhere. Um, and so after, uh, so getting back to that, that dose response curve, we started figuring out there was some other things possibly going on. Um, and we started noticing that there's, there's toxicity to critters beyond just people. And so I won't go into it here, you guys can ask if you want, but, but coral, shrimp, uh, the classic mercury poisoning in this bay in Japan, um, and we started to get a better understanding of what some of these uh, toxins can do. As far as plastic goes, plastic is um, uh, a fantastically, amazingly well-engineered uh, uh, piece of material. It's, in, it's, it's really mind-blowing how sophisticated the, the engineering, the design of these products are. And we see this all over. This is typically what we think about when we, hear, when we talk about plastic pollution. So we think about critters getting entangled, or a straw up a turtle's nose, or, or stuff on the beach, or something like that. Those are all real. I don't mean to dismiss those. But, but that's but one part of the problem. That those are problems, but there's many other problems going on. So for example, this is one of our first big uh, microplastic studies. This is looking at, looks clean, on a beach, nice and clean sand, grab a handful of sand. And I do this with, I just did this with kids in Hawaii, do this with Cub Scout groups, do this with um, school groups in the South Pacific, all over the place. Uh, take a, a grab of sand. Hey, this looks clean. This looks clean. I don't see any trash. I don't see any debris on the, on the, um, on the sand. Uh, throw it into some saline solution, shake it up, put it in a microscope, and oh my God, it's loaded with plastic, right? And so that's what we're seeing here. So these are um, in this case, this is about 50 beaches. The specifics don't matter. They're ranked north to south. But, but basically, this is plastic particles or, or a piece of plastic that was bigger and broke down, so a fragmented piece, or a fiber, which mostly comes from our clothing. Um, and so the reds are fibers, the yellows are particles. And suffice it to say, every single beach we've looked at has plastics. Not in California, around the planet. So we're up to about 400 beaches, middle of the Pacific, Northern, North Pole, everywhere, every place has, some have a little bit more, some have a little bit less, and there's some, 
different patterns, but, but it, it is a ubiquitous part of our society. It's part of the Anthropocene now. Um, and so we've been, we've been uh, making lots and lots of plastic. The specifics don't matter here, but this is probably one of the best estimates of how much plastic we produced. So you, you can ignore the numbers, but just look at the magnitude, the size of the arrows. So on the left, this is how much uh, primary, that means stuff we made originally, virgin plastic that we made, how much we've made, um, and then how much is recycled. So the orange stuff is how much is recycled. So all the BS is about these little triangles, there's a whole lot of energy that goes into making you feel stupid or you feel bad for making sure I throw my bottle in this thing. That is by design. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but that is absolutely by design to get you to think about what you're doing as opposed to talking about the system. Why does the system, why when I go into the store, are all the, only the t-shirts synthetic? Why can't I buy, why can't I easily buy cotton or something else, right? It's designed to make you feel bad and you put your energy into what is my carbon footprint? What is my da 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 And those have some value to be sure. But the real energy should be, we should be asking why have we inherited this unjust system in the first place? Um, so anyway, so, so, so everybody would have you think that this, this recycle thing, we've got to really work on doubling that. That's BS. Triple it. Ten times it. It's not going to make a difference, right? We need a different system. Okay. What are plastics? Plastics are Lego blocks, literally. So they're polymers um, made up of monomers, right? Um, while we can make them up from other materials, almost all the plastics we have now are made from petroleum, the vast majority of that from natural gas, the natural gas fraction. Um, but basically we have a backbone, right? So it's like snapping a bunch of little small Lego blocks together to make a big long thing. Uh, and we have, we have those things, which are the polymer backbones. So we use those to understand what these materials are and we find these and, and fingerprint these IDs, uh, um, these um, uh, items. And then there's also additives, things to make it more flexible, things to make it colored. And so with macroplastics, things like uh, you and I would touch, we usually focus on the polymers. That's usually what, uh, that's what our tools um, are best optimized to, design, to capture. But actually, we have these, some new fancy tools I showed in that video. For microfibers, we can do stuff down to four, um, uh, four microns in terms of diameter, which is you know, like a fraction of a human hair. Um, and sometimes the backbones are used, but more importantly than those, we usually use the additives because they, they tend to have a stronger signal. And then we know that this additive is used with polyurethane, and so that was the polyurethane fiber, that kind of stuff. So we have primary and secondary plastics. Some plastics are, des uh, microplastics, excuse me, some are designed to be small from the get-go. So this would be things like microbeads that would go in our toothpaste or our makeup to act as an abrasive. Um, but the vast majority of, of plastics, though, are secondary, meaning they were, they were created as, you know, as a t-shirt or created as a cup, and then through sun or waves or wind or whatever, they've, they've cracked and they've broken into ever smaller pieces. So we call those secondary or degraded plastics. There's a whole range of terms here. Um, suffice it to say, the media and everybody will tend to focus on these, these the, on the left side of the scale here, the larger things, things we can easily see for understandable reasons. And then in the last couple of years, this term microplastic has gotten, has gotten big, right? This is basically stuff less than five millimeters, but bigger than a micron. Um, and then the newest frontier, uh, so my machine is super expensive and hard to get. It was the first one in our, our part of the country. Um, and it was uh, $150,000, so super expensive. The new machines to do the nanoplastics are about 1.1 million for one machine, right? So, so I cannot buy this. There's no way I'll buy this. No way Chong can buy this. This is a university has to buy these types of, uh, of equipment. And that'll only get us into the very, very topmost range of the nanoplastic range. So we're constantly developing new tools to get deeper insights into these things. But suffice it to say, as we go ever smaller, the toxicity is actually worse. So the smaller and smaller and smaller, the more diverse the, the chemical pathways, the more, more diverse the possible problems for wildlife, et cetera. And there's all kinds of morphology here, which probably don't have time to talk about, but we see all these things. Um, this is my new fancy machine. So, so this, thing on the, this thing in the middle is it called an ATR. You guys have those, right? In fact, you guys probably have one of these too. I'm sure you probably have these now. You guys are a big research university. Um, so the ATR is for the macroplastics. The thing on the left is the same exact technology, but cooled with liquid nitrogen, and it's coupled with a microscope. So we can shoot a very, 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 very small, thin needle point laser beam, hit that object, get the signal back, and use spectrophotometry to understand what, it, what it's made out of. And this is, you get something like this. And now if I was a chemist, I would, you know, back in the day, you'd sit there and drink a lot of coffee and say, I think this is probably, but you know, screw that. 
Um, I'm techno I use a lot of technology, but I and Sean, we're both technology agnostic. We just want the data, right? We don't, we, I mean, maybe this technology is great. If it changes tomorrow, we'll go with some new technology. In this case, I have about $20,000 worth of libraries inside my machine, and it automatically matches. So I put this up, and it goes, Brr, there's a 90% chance this is, there's an 89% chance this is, so it's great. That means people that aren't sophisticated chemists can use this technology, and as this becomes more ubiquitous, this is the way you will monitor environmental pollutants you know, 10 years from now, right? So, so it's a really cool new technology that doesn't create waste, doesn't take you know, hours and hours of technician's time, doesn't create a bunch of byproducts and everything, it just directly characterizes the material. Okay, so yeah, big things go to small things. Um, <laughs> we've talked about the magnitude, ubiquity. Um, these are all the different ways. Uh, so electromagnetic radiation toxicity, not a problem with plastics. There's no heat, there's no sound, there's no uh, radioactive decay toxicity. Other than those, every single other category of toxicity that we know of on the planet is associated with plastic, right? So it, they do uh, mutagenic effects, they do cancerous impacts, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so they really are this panoply of, of bad things. And just a couple quick examples, so this is, um, I can tell you all kinds of stories, but this is a shrimp, and it's been imaged so that that glowing green stuff, that's microplastics in its gut. Um, and so we now have evidence that these plastics cross the blood-brain barrier. Just a couple weeks, a couple months ago, um, what freaked everybody out, I can't tell you how many reporters and people, you know, whatever recall, um, uh, this was in The Lancet. Anybody, anybody heard this story about the heart attacks and strokes? So basically, um, uh, about four years ago, um, some, some medical doctors were, were, were working on strokes. They were looking, these are in humans now, looking at um, people that, that had clogged arteries. So they had some plaque buildup. So they went in, and normally they just throw in a stint and, you know, and make that, make that tube a little bit wider and, 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 you know, not clogged. But in this case, they did a little scraping. They took some samples of that stuff. I'm going to get the numbers wrong now that I'm talking about. It's about 350 people they did this on. And, th and then they you know, got them back and everybody was cool and everybody, everybody was back and doing stuff. Th but then they followed them for three years and they looked at those plastics. 150 of the, or excuse me, looked at those plaques. 150 of those plaques inside had microplastics. And they weren't regular, they weren't like worn down microplastics, they were pretty raw. So when they looked at them with a scanning electron microscope, they were really jagged. So one of the hypotheses is that maybe this plaque is in partly resp response to this sort of foreign body stuck in veins, right? So that's kind of freaky. Oh my God, that's super scary. Everybody breathe. Oh my God. Okay, <laughs> next, they followed these people for a couple years. The people, the 150 people that had, their, their, their plaques had microplastics in them, they were five times more likely to have a stroke or heart attack in the two years they monitored compared to the people that didn't have microplastics in their thing. So again, these th we, we're just barely beginning to scratch the surface. These have clearly detrimental impacts, but it's so crazy and it's so non-linear, it's, it's challenging to figure out. Um, we hear about things like this, the giant Pacific garbage patch, um, and this is, these are real things, um, accumulations of plastic in the ocean, and this gets a lot of media attention, and it's a real challenge, it's a real problem, but everybody wants to clean this up. We ain't gonna clean this up, right? It, it's, that's not happening, don't waste your time. Um, we've been monitoring plastic in a whole bunch of different contexts, so, so with, citizen scientists and, and macroscopic stuff and everything. Um, and uh, we do various things, we do a lot of training. So we, we, do, we help develop this standard. So in California, we now have microplastics in drink. Uh, all of our water agencies have to monitor microplastics loading in people's drinking water. And everybody's freaked out about it. So that just started last year. Um, for four years, that all these agencies are gonna have to monitor their microplastics, how much, how much they're exposing the public to. But what they're really freaked out about is after four years, there's gonna be some guidance about you have to lower the microplastics in, in drinking water, and that's what they're freaked out about. So we were with an uh, international team that helped define the, the methodology that the state's using now and requiring everybody to use. So we do a lot of training, like I'm gonna do this weekend. Um, uh, but then other things. So for example, on the right, uh, micro, lower right, microplastics in agricultural soils. In California, we use a lot of, in my county, especially Ventura County, we have a lot of, uh, we do a lot of strawberries. So we have a lot of tarping, plastic tarping. Um, and so there's, there's actually more plastic in the middle of the farms than on the roadways on the edges of the farms. And that's what that, that figure's showing. Um, and then because, like, why not? We also do a lot with beer because beer's fun. 
And so, um, so we've been looking at how microplastic loading happens in, in microbrews around. So that means we have to go sample microbrews. It's a very difficult job, dude. <laughs> do this stuff. So um, essentially what we found is, uh, and so this is a super great guy. The guy named, uh, uh, owns a brewery called Leashless Brewing. Super great guy. Uh, um, um, uh, molecular biologist by training um, in, into being as sustainable as possible. This, this lower uh, blue guy. So this is all... Um, uh, in you know stainless steel vats. So this is a this is a you know decent scale micro microbrewery, but it's not you know industrial scale. Um, and so in the in the this lower this control here in city water, these guys there's always a little bit of microplastic just floating around everywhere, right? So there's it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. So we start off with a little bit of microplastic, but then um, then we start to do the brewing process. And so every different stage of the brewing process, we go sample some of the material, right? So take it out, take it back to the lab, filter it, etc. And this is what we found. As soon as we start brewing the, brewing the beer, the microplastics spike up. And we're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Like, how, like, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's no plastic inside the chamber. There's no rubber seals that will you know, be leaked. Can't figure it out. Long story short is, uh, at one point, we went and we're looking. And the, if, you're, if you're Anheuser-Busch, you get all your wheat and barley in a big, giant-ass um, uh, tanker truck. Right? It all comes in, and they dump it in the hopper and put it in the silo. And zzz, but if you're a small microbrew, you, do, you don't do that. You go out and you buy 50-pound bags of this stuff, right? So it turns out, we're like, hey, can I have one of those bags? When we fingerprinted the plastic on the bags, that's where the microplastics were coming from. So the plastic surrounding the grain were rubbing off, abrading, and getting into the grain. Then when they dumped the grain, and that's where it came from. So the good news is when you get to the final clarification process, it's basically back down to background levels. But it speaks to this idea of this, this stuff is, is ubiquitous, right? We're never going to get rid of it unless we stop all plastic stuff. So, so if the goal is to scrape every single grain of sand across the world's beaches, yeah, good luck, right? It ain't going to happen. If you're going to drink all the beer on the planet to take care of the microplastics, thank you for your service. But, but that's probably not helpful also, right? So we really have to talk about at the upstream level. Oh, and then this one on the upper right is, so we've also been monitoring airborne microplastics. So in our university rooms, in just room just like this and outside, Long story short, in here you're inhaling twice as much, on average, twice as many microplastics as you are outside. So these rooms leak microplastics. I can tell you all kinds of stories about that, about my new clean lab room. It was not a clean lab room. Okay, um, so let's talk about per perception, right? Uh, engaging with the public, making sure we can talk to everyone is, is you know, absolutely essential. And not just essential to get something done, but to truly bring them along. And so, um, so it's important. So we've been, we do, uh, pub one of my classes, my coastal management students do polling every fall. We survey about 1,500 people face-to-face -face in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties and ask them various questions. Some of the questions that you guys answered earlier, which is great. Um, we asked we ask the general public, we, um, and this is various versions over the years, but basically we say, hey, prioritize, let's look at this guy, um, threats to the coastal zone. Um, uh, as, and you guys had this, it was a slightly different version than I asked you guys, I asked you a simpler version, but I, we asked people to rank stuff. So this on the left is, is the greatest threat on average, and this is the lowest threat. In fact, we've stopped asking this question because every single year was the exact same answer and it was like, it was like boring. But here we go. Everybody thinks, at least the general pu public, when we talk about threats, pollution. Pollution, 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 pollution. These are all real threats, to be sure. I'm not trying to, you know, marginalize anything, but, but I think, um, and, and, then, and then comes habitat fragmentation, they think, and then over harvesting, and then invasive species. Almost always, since the 70s, this is how these things fall out. If we ask people in Europe, if we ask people in the US, wherever, we have this perception that the biggest environmental problem is pollution. You guys, because Sean's a great teacher and you guys are reading your stuff, give yourselves a hand. <laughs> no. I mean, some people think pollution, and, and yeah, I don't want to make anybody feel bad or you know, feel guilty or something. But the vast majority of you say, no, it's something else. In this case, over harvesting, right? So that's what you guys thought uh, as of last night. Um, but the fact remains, most of the public care, or, or thinks pollution is the thing. So therefore, this microplastic stuff is actually an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to engage with people that maybe we don't have when we talk about the endangered critter. When we talk about the developmental pressure up in this watershed that maybe people aren't going to engage. Pollution, we can actually pull more people into a conversation. Um, and when we talk about some of these things, so this is a, a different survey. So this was asking people, this was, this was in the COVID times. So this, this particular question was very low. It was only 400 people. So um, for us, that's an incredibly small sample size. But, um, but suffice it to say, we said, 
rank these threats, right? We made up a bunch of different things. So this side is, is the general public thinks these are the hardest things to solve. This way over here is like relatively easiest thing to solve. This is a fake thing. So this, this is a, a dummy question to help us sort of understand error when people just make up answers on a survey. So that's relatively low. But oh my god, I'm feeling very calm now. <laughs> I'm feeling very calm now. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, so here we go. Overfishing, right? You guys talk about overharvesting? The public thinks that's like the least, that's the easiest thing to solve. Easiest thing to solve. They think, uh, and, and whether these are significantly different or not, this group, that's, that's debatable because the sample size is relatively low. But at least political polarization, which I think we all agree is a huge problem, is very high. Next, microplastics. Hot damn. What? So this issue, people think that is, is at least as challenging to solve as, as the liberals and the conservatives can't drink beer together, right? So that's crazy. Then comes sea level rise. Then comes how almost, then comes racism. Like what? What? Microplastics are harder than racism? What? Right? Um, so so um, again, opportunity. And oppor this means that people are paying attention, right? Whereas if we talk about endangered salamander or some bird that John studies, people are going to be like, OK, a bird. But microplastics, they're going to probably open and, and they're much more likely to skim that article, right? So use that. That's a superpower you have. Use that, right? We ha we're worried about all these issues, but some of the issues we understand gain more attention. So we can use those as a you know, crowbar in to talking with the public about some of these, these other things. OK, and then I'll just finish up before we talk about deep sea mining, because I'll probably run out of time. Oh my god. OK, is, um, so here are petrochemical facilities in the US. Here are resin factories. So these are the things that are making the nurdles, which, which are the, the base material that we then melt down and, and, and form into plastics. So you'll notice that, that these are all over the place, California, by you guys, down south. These are not. There's a reason for that, right? Um, and so this tells me that policies matter. This tells me that where we, if we want to exert um, you know, influence, we actually can do that. Uh, one of the, uh, near, I do, as Tom mentioned, I do uh, a lot of work in Louisiana. This is an example of a, a place that's uh, known as Cancer Alley, which is next to some of these refineries. Disproportionately poor, disproportionately African American, uh, very much so disenfranchised. Let's put the chemical plant there. Right, that makes sense. Right, we don't want to put it in the nice area because that's like not so good. But we'll put it in with the poor folks, and they won't complain and whatever. Um, so this is ap microplastics are ap absolutely on top of everything else, an environmental justice issue as well. We can make a difference. So this issue of oh my God, it's in every sand grain. I'm just going to drink myself, smoke myself to death. We can't do anything. B.S. We can make a difference. So all kinds of policies are, are coming online, um, including in our state now. Um, we have uh, what we call ex EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. The idea here is that just because I bought this shirt doesn't mean it's my problem. It's actually the folks that make that, they have to consider the life cycle of the item. The first target coming up, styrofoam. So as of next year, which everybody claims is all recyclable, which is all bullshit, um, uh, uh, they have to prove that styrofoam is actually responsible. Otherwise, after next year, you, uh, you'll be able to use styrofoam in medical products. You'll be able to use styrofoam to chill seafood, but, but basically nothing else, right? Where we have alternatives, there's, there's no reason. For, we shouldn't be having clamshell containers that have made out of styrofoam. That's like, you know, what are we listening to? Yacht Rock and, you know, 70s horrible things. Everyone. Okay. Um, so, so this is coming on from legislation, right? And so over the next couple of years, other types of plastics also will have to be proven to be recyclable or, um, or they'll not be able to be sold, right? And so it's putting the responsibility on the manufacturers, the upstream, the system, as opposed to you feeling guilty and trying to put this in your, well, you're a dumbass. You didn't put it in the right bin. And so that's why it was a problem, right? Okay. Microplastics. Uh, talk about deep sea and like Five minutes or something. Any questions about microplastics so far? Yeah. Um, it, I see like a lot of products that collect plastic from plants. Mm -hmm. Does the toxicity differ from that? Uh, not entirely sure yet. So the question is, uh, so we see some of these things that say bioplastics or something. Does the toxicity differ? Um, not sure. Probably. The problem is, um, the problem is this can is aluminum. It looks like it's aluminum, right? Bullshit inside is lined with plastic. 
Um, so there's a layer in here. So I can just put water in here and drink this can. It's totally cool. But if I leave this can of Diet Coke or 7-Up or whatever on the shelf for a long time, eventually the carbonation will start to you know, attack that aluminum. So we put a plastic coating around it. Most of, I should have brought a food container, most of the containers we have have up to about seven different layers of materials. So even though the, maybe the core backbone might be that bioplastic, there'll be something to keep the oils out. There'll be something to make it shiny. There'll be something, and those other layers are usually the traditional plastics. So we're making progress. It's a good first step, but we're really far from that being a solution. So if I was going to choose, I would buy, I would, if I could, if I was buying, if I was putting stuff in a bag and I had a bioplastic bag or a traditional one, I would choose the bioplastic. But, but it's like baby steps so far. Cool, good question. Yeah? Do you have a question, like, when you are like in the, the sea, right, like, there are a lot of like, shippings and navies or things like yeah. that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, do they contaminate as well? And do they have problems like traveling in the sea, like the shipping? Uh, they don't have problems uh, like, like being blocked or something. They don't, they don't so much have that, although sometimes, oh, big containers, sometimes. Um, uh, but what I would say is that um, uh, in some colleagues group that's trying to look hindcast how much plastic has been, for example, in the ocean over, over the years, we see this weird, well, this is preliminary, so I, this is not proven yet, but it see, there seems to be a dip in the early 90s in terms of the plastic, microplastics in the ocean. Uh, we're kind of, it was just a little bit of dip, and we're back up to like the levels that we were before and actually more now. But and people are trying to struggle for what was, what was an explanation, there was an international moratorium on dumping trash in the ocean that went into, a, the, into effect in the early 90s. So it used to be cruise ships, tankers, have lunch, put it in a bag, throw it overboard. Was, was it was all legit. And then after that, it said, no, no, you gotta save it, either incinerate it or you gotta save it and bring it home and, and put it in a landfill. And that at least correlates with this decrease in the plastic loading that we seem to have seen. Um, so, so while ships don't get hit or whatever, it, is, it seems that um, even though you would think the ocean is vast, and there's only so many ships, we seem to have maybe had some influence directly by, by stopping to dump stuff uh, off of ships. Does that answer your question, kind of? Any other plastic questions you guys are wondering about? Okay, we'll do deep sea really fast. Okay, so another example of, of, of our expanding technologies, so that microplastics is an example of our expanding technologies, so now we can actually understand these things, perceive these things. Up until a few years ago, I couldn't tell what that little piece of thing was. It was just too small. So these technological innovations allow us to see more completely and understand more of the holistic uh, goings on. So same thing with the deep sea. Okay, uh, super fast. This is a map of the sediments around the ocean. It's not ubiquitous. There's some areas that have more stuff than others, has to do with ocean currents and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then let's talk a little bit, very briefly, about deep sea mining. So this starts with a Cold War lie. The US hated the Soviet Union, Soviet Union hated the US, we wanted to kill each other, because why not? Let's blow, let's destroy the world seven times over with, with missiles and stuff. And so we're all developing this submarine technology. At one point, but we have, we, the US, have a very sophisticated, what's called SONUS, this, this network that was monitoring things. The Russians uh, uh, in the late 60s had this sub go out, nuclear sub. It, uh, it sinks. The Soviets don't know where it is. We know where it is. So we're like, hey, we want this sub. But it was so deep, we couldn't. It was beyond the current technology of diving. So um, when we didn't want to send out a bunch of you know, Navy ships, because then, then it would be like the Soviets like, what are you doing? And so um, uh, we found it. The U.S. Navy found it and took photographs, like remotely, but we couldn't get to it. So they really wanted to get these code books, really wanted to see what this was. So trying to figure out, what do we do, what do we do? They're like, and, and it was the Cold War. So money's no option. We're going to go to the moon. In this case, we're going to go to the bottom of the ocean. What do you want to do? Let's get this crazy ass dude to do it. So they call up Howard Hughes, that everybody thinks is crazy. Hey, let's have this guy do it. And they're like, we're going to give you as much money as you want. And he's like, okay, that sounds great. I can trim my fingernails and shit. And so. <laughs> He builds this thing, which is called the Glomar Explorer. Why are you going to spend you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars building something? You have to have an excuse. So he said, we'll do deep sea mining. So they build this thing, ostensibly to go mine the bottom of the ocean. It was not. It was designed to hover over this sub, open up a bay, go down, and with like grappling hooks, essentially, and lift bags, grab that submarine, lift it up into the belly. Turns out that didn't work. The sub broke apart, and they, couldn't, they, they got a little piece of it, but it didn't really work. But then we had this thing called the Glomar Explorer. And it was secret for a long time, and, but, but this started the first deep sea mining boom. When all these people saw 
all this money being invested, Canadians, all these people are like, oh my God, we should start mining the bottom of the ocean because if these guys are spending hundreds of millions of dollars, we better lemming it, right? We better follow those guys off the cliff. And so we started doing that. So it started in the 70s as sort of mini, the first boom of deep sea mining. And of course, it was a dumbass idea and nobody made any money, so all those companies went bankrupt. But, but it was the first sort of step down this road. Uh, this, the, the original ship was, com was decommissioned in the oil slump of the mid-teens, um, but uh, the remnant crane, the crane is, was pulled off and recycled, and that's what's actually now in Baltimore helping clear the bridge, helping clear the Francis Scott uh, Key Bridge. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, deep sea mining. There's three main targets of deep sea mining. There's cobalt crusts, there's uh, hydrothermal vent chimneys, and there's polymetallic nodules. Cobalt crusts, nobody's really seriously going after those. These are essentially uh, the bottoms of undersea mountains, volcanoes, that uh, because of the way the currents blow, um, it sort of exposes the rock, and so it's easy to get at some of these minerals. Um, hydrothermal vents are um, uh, essentially the deposition from, from this magma and stuff from down in the ocean, and stuff gets deposited. And so we tried a little thing here. This, is, this no longer works, Project Nautilus. But this was in uh, this area, Papua New Guinea, um, and they went and actually tried cutting out with little robots, cutting off, like, like with big fancy chainsaws, cutting off these smokestacks and then bringing them up. It wasn't financially uh, beneficial. Um, but the main thing, and this is where everybody's focusing on now, are these polymetallic nodules. These are just um, little rocks deposited on the bottom of the ocean. And so I'll play a little video for you. I thought I'll play a video. Maybe I'm not going to play a video. Oh, that was on a bit. Okay, that, sorry, that, that's online. I should have gotten online. It doesn't matter. Um, I'll, I'll send you the video. You guys can watch. Okay, so this is me holding one of these things. This guy's big. This guy is about five, six million years old, and that thing in my hand, right? Um, and you saw in my earlier videos, if we cut into almost all of these, a shark tooth inside. So one of the things we're working on in my lab is we're, we're trying to scan these and better understand. They don't just form anywhere. They form at the top of the teeth as opposed to the spike of the, uh, of the tooth. So we're trying to understand that and, and do some stuff um, in my lab. Uh, and that's what we're doing over on the right. And so the first trial, that's in my dentist office. What? So we do a lot of 3D printing and scanning. Now my dentist has this crap. So when you want to make a filling, you used to jam all that horrible crap in your mouth and you and then it would solidify and they pull out and they use that to make a mold. Now they just 3D camera it. And so when I was talking to my dentist, I was like, can I bring in these shark teeth from the bottom of the ocean with these weird ass nodules on? He's like, sure, let's try it. And so that's what, so we're in the dentist's office uh, 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 trying to image these things. Anyway, um, so, this is, so this is what these things look like on the lower left, more typically. It's a field, right? Most of the bottom of the ocean is mud, very little hard substrate. Um, and these hard substrates are these manganese nodules, right? Um, why do we want them? because we're trying to get off of fossil fuels. And so we need a lot more rare earth uh, elements um, to make this transition, to build the batteries, to be able to store electricity. Um, electric cars, whatever he talks about, but all over the place we need these things. Um, and this is the International Energy Agency's prediction. It doesn't matter what the year is, we just need more and more of this stuff. Right now, the plan is to rape Indonesia, screw over the middle of Africa, uh, have child labor, have no environmental protections. That's where we get most of these metals from, right? And so doing mining anywhere, bad idea. Let's not mine unless we're in the real world and we need materials, right? Um, so I'm, to full disclosure, I'm on a science advisory panel for the metals company. Um, and so I'm one of the people that's helping to um, provide guidance in terms of the environmental impact of what this stuff may or may not be. It's still evolving as we're speaking. Um, but, uh, but the idea here is it's bad to mine the bottom of the ocean. But what we're finding is it seems to be less impactful than doing it in the Indonesian rainforest, than the other alternatives, right? When we talk about all of these issues, microplastics, endangered species, you, you cannot be the philosophy, I was a philosophy major for a while. You cannot be the philosophy major. Well, theoretically, we shouldn't, man, uh, screw that. We are, the plane is going down, right? We need to pull back on that joystick. We need to make some hard choices. And one of those choices means that um, some of the things we choose will not be perfect, right? Some of the things are gonna have some problems, absolutely. But just because there's some problems, we have to, uh, as an adult, balance all the pluses, balance all the negatives, and that's a hard thing to do. But you all, as people that have taken this conservation biology class, whether you're a conservation biology or not person at the end of this, you have a responsibility. When these conversations come up, that you speak reality to craziness. Okay, so this is what we're doing. So, we're, so the current plan is, 
I'm going to run out of time, but I'll just leave with one example. So we're lowering these, these things to the bottom of the ocean, basically vacuum cleaners. And we're going to vacuum up these nodules. Not all nodules, little things we're going to leave behind, things that I was holding my hand too big, we're leave. Just we're going to take the ones that are about the size of my thumb, like the first digit of my thumb, about that size. They'll be sucked up, go up to a riser about four kilometers up, and then, and then into a hopper, and then we melt them. Uh, almost no waste. There's sand and then five different rare earth metals. When we mine on land or here in Utah or in California, whatever, we take stuff and then we add a bunch of acid and we add some cyanide and we do all this crap. We have all these, these tailings. No. This thing goes into a superheated furnace and the stuff just melts out. So there's almost no waste um, in terms of material waste. There's, there's maybe some emissions, but there's no, like carbon emissions, but there's no, there's no um, residual slag pile or anything like that. Um, okay. These things are not everywhere. They're concentrated. And the thing that everybody's worried or focused on now is the clarion clipperton zone, which is about halfway between Hawaii and Baja. Um, we have a bunch of metals in there. This is that area. Um, the International Seabed Authority is the entity that, that's permitting this. The whole area is, and, and so their jurisdiction is most of the world's oceans. This is the clarion clipperton zone. Each of the little things. And so rather than the old way of doing stuff, which is we, or England, or Russia would go out and go, mine. The idea with this is the area has been surveyed, and the, the idea is it's a resource for all of humanity. So the area has been divvied up amongst all the countries of the world, right? I should say all the signators of the International Seabed Authority. We, as the US, we help create the International Law of the Sea Treaty. We are one of the only countries on the planet to not sign it, because, you know, UN. <laughs> so, um, so we don't have a territory in here, but everybody else does. And so the idea here is, um, Cook Islands has a thing. Cook Islands doesn't have, to, doesn't have to mine it. Cook Islands can sell its contract, right? But Cook Islands will get the revenue from the lease. And so this is where we're going right now. And so this is the metals company, which is the company that is um, leading this and is about to start production. They, they're working with um, uh, Nauru and a couple other uh, Pacific Islands on their holdings. Um, and I run out of time, probably not time to talk about this, but there's worried about impacts of, of trophic things, of, of fish populations. Turns out, um, the, the, the debris plume, the, 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 the sediment that comes out, will be releasing lower than most of the tuna populations move. But, um, but I'll just say, this is what I want to end on. So, so we must, so we are scientists, right? Uh, Chan and I do a lot of stuff that has policy implications. We advise on things, but I'll just speak for myself. I usually don't take an official position. I'm the scientist guy. So I will lay out the facts and, and answer questions. But I view my position as calling balls and strikes. That means we have to call real balls and real strikes, not just the guys that we like or guys we don't like. And so in this case, um, this is Greenpeace. So Greenpeace was one of the groups that said, deep sea mining, we should not do deep sea mining until we understand the impacts. We should monitor and see what's going on. Totally agree. The metals company just spent $60 million on the first environmental impact statement. I would share data with you, but it's not shareable yet, so I'm not allowed to share it. But, um, but suffice it to say, um, they are trying to do it the right way, in my opinion, right? It's mining, there's going to be impacts, but they're trying to set the bar very, very high so that other companies, particularly the Chinese companies, that do not have, uh, that don't, shall we say, care about environmental impact. So we're trying to set the standards so that everybody else does at least that level of environmental monitoring and impact understanding. So Greenpeace is like, don't be mining. So the last several years have been all preliminary stuff, tests, trials. Let's, let's see how this, how this machine works, what are the impacts. So two summers ago, we did a test run, drove this thing on the bottom, and then came back last fall to monitor to see what the impact was. The big worry was sediment plumes. The big worry is all the stuff gets kicked up, smothers all the fish, smothers all these, these you know, uh, um, crinoids and different things like that. We go back to monitor to see what happened. Greenpeace has decided this is a moneymaker for them. Many people have decided this is a good deal for them, and they get their name in the paper and everything. So Greenpeace decided to protest this scientific monitoring vessel. So they grappling hooked onto their ship. One guy fell in the water, thank God, didn't die, because he's in the middle of like the ocean, right? Um, uh, they occupied the ship for five days, and all these scientists were like, ooh. So they just sat around. So it cut short all of our monitoring, right? So these guys that supposedly said that we want to monitor were like, see, we're stopping mining. And it was like, dude. So same, 100%, exactly, same topic, or same strategy, tobacco, same exact strategy as oil and gas. 
delay, 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 say you want science, and then don't do science. In this case, coming from the enviros. So this is what, I can only show you a little bit of data, and then we'll end on this. So it seems great. This is nine months on the left hand. This is a, this is a ROV shot. So this is one of the, so you see like, it looks like tracks. So that was the, that was the, um, the collector, ching, 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 going to the bottom. On the left was right after it went through. So this is two summers ago. On the right is what it looked like in the fall. So you'll note there's, there's um, a little, in white, there's a you know, little filter feeder right there that if everybody was worried that we're going to kick up all the sediment and it's going to go for kilometers and kill everything, create a dead zone, uh, how's that dude still alive? How's that dude still alive? Right? How's this, how's this uh, tunicate, still very delicate tunicate that was right outside the footprint, how is that still alive? So it turns out when, because uh, I'm an idiot is the answer. So when, when, I, they, when they give me samples or, or we take samples, we throw something down, grab it from the bottom of the ocean. Again, how deep is the, is the world's ocean? Oh yeah, good. <laughs> I don't, four kilometers, somebody pay attention. I love it, four kilometers. Okay, so four kilometers, so it's deep as shit, right? It's very deep, cold. So we go down, grab something, bring it up, massive amounts of pressure down it. Comes up and I get it, it looks like snot. I get a jar and it's got sediment and there's all this floating snot on the top. So when I look at that and everybody's like, oh my God, when we mine in this, it's all flocculent. We're gonna be cooking up all this stuff. It's gonna, it's gonna have, kill the fish. It's gonna, oh, horrible bad stuff. That's what all of our models come from. Turns out when we lowered the collector, the, the engineer's like, hey, this thing might sink a, a, maybe as much as half a meter into the sediment. We went out there, it sank an, a centimeter. Like, wait, what? So it turns out it's actually really consolidated. It's not flocculent. There's some modelers in Texas working on this out, but what seems to have happened is when we bring it up, that pressure, the gases come out of solution and they make it. So the process of lifting it up makes it sort of snotty. So down deep, it's much more consolidated. So it turns out, again, this on the right is after nine months, you can still see all these nodules. It's not a sea of sediment. It's not destroyed, which is great. That means our impact seems to be much more constrained. Unfortunately, we only have 12 data runs here. We should have hundreds because that's when Greenpeace boarded the ship. So suffice it to say, um, this all the, yeah, I'll end with that. So suffice it to say, um, um, all this stuff uh, is about increasing capacity, right? We have incredible new tools now. It's easy to be wondering, like, are we depressed? But there's incredible optimism, right? So as long as we keep our eyes on the prize and remember to have fun, and having fun is really important. So this is Sean and I out in Turkey with a, with a sleeping bear um, that uh, is about to wake up, and then there's a funny story there. But, um, but, so, um, but conservation is better with friends. Don't, want, don't read this news in your dorm room and get all depressed. Go out, have a beer, go do some stuff, engage. It it's, makes a huge, huge difference. And I'll just end saying our friend um, that passed away last year, Onder here, um, uh, it's hard, to, a life of conservation can be hard, right? We don't make a lot of money and all this kind of stuff, but it's a rewarding life. And I would hope that you all think about that when you're thinking about your career paths. This is a fun place to do. This is a fun thing to work on. It might seem scary, but engaging with it is very empowering. So thanks, you guys. I'll take any questions, but we're probably out of time.